Hello, I'm Abigail Van Gelder from the Center for Entrepreneurship. It's my privilege to welcome you to today's panel. We have invited professionals from organizations around Oregon to share their innovations and struggles in extending STEM education to the next generation of entrepreneurs. They will be discussing issues related to inclusivity, program development, and emerging trends. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Abby Croman, from the School of Business here at PSU. Through her work at Portland State University, along with XForm, In Accord, and the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers Hub in Portland, Abby is helping to create changes focused on the environmental impact of innovation and social inclusivity in an entrepreneurship. Please welcome Abby Croman. Greetings, and thank you for joining us. Our panel is assembled today on the traditional ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It's important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy their lives and their descendants. Just last month, the Day One Project, supported by the Lemelson Foundation, produced a report that illustrates what the report calls the Invention Ecosystem, a pathway to economic resilience and inclusive prosperity. It also presents a challenge. America is not preparing scientific leaders, it says. The report also describes a big idea build a strong invention ecosystem, which inspires and prepares students to address crucial challenges and thrive in the emerging innovation economy. To get there, support inventors and entrepreneurs so that they can create value from their ideas in the form of products and businesses. We explored this report as we put together our conversation today with Tong Zhang from Oregon Mesa and Yoon Han from Girls Inc. Pacific Northwest. These two experts work every day on preparing innovators, particularly in the K-12 years, and we're grateful to have a chance to learn from them today. Welcome, Tong and Yoon. To start with, would you please introduce yourself and tell us how, through your work, you're preparing innovators. Uh, Yoon, would you please start? Hi everybody, my name is Yoon Han. I'm the Eureka Program Manager with Girls Inc. of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and we are preparing innovators by, we, we provide safe and inclusive places um, to the best of our ability to remove or address directly social barriers that impact, and in some cases prevent youth from, um, from learning, from trying and you know, engaging in that learning process in a critical way. Uh, we directly address the factors that allow for youth to succeed, all the social impacts in the curriculum, and also incorporating the trauma-informed care and inclusive practices into our everyday operations. Um, and so that might look like, you know, for, in terms of the social impacts in our curriculum, we have, uh, we directly lean into what our youth might be experiencing that impacts their learning, that impacts their confidence. Um, and so we have a curriculum around body positivity, for example, of really examining what the, um, what the, how the norms are placed around uh, how youth might look at their body, how they think about themselves, and kind of dissecting that so that the youth feel a little bit more empowered, a little bit more knowledgeable around formulating their own understanding of how they want their body to be in this world. Um, and, and then for in terms of incorporating a trauma-informed practice and inclusive practice into our everyday operations, we take extreme care to ensure that we are being mindful about how we as an organization and staff are showing up, especially when it comes to having a direct engagement with the youth. And so you'll, you might notice that we use the term youth instead of girls. Um, because Girls Inc. is committed to providing a comprehensive experience to girls, including those who were assigned female at, um, at birth and those who are exploring their gender identity or expression during their time at Girls Inc. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we'll in ensure that we are using terms to kind of standardize that inclusive practice and um, also looking at how we speak around body norming or any other identity specific thing around um, abilities or racial identity or LGBTQIA+, all of those things. We take extreme care to ensure that we aren't ostracizing everybody and just include that in our practice, uh, in, in our external curriculum, as well as our internal um, kind of how we keep our house. Thank you so much, Yoon. And Tom. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. My name is Tong Zhang. I am the executive director of Oregon Mesa. So Oregon Mesa prepares um, young inventors in a number of ways. For a long time, Mesa has been um, a purely STEM program in the fact that we work with middle and high school students through providing professional development to teachers. And then the teachers are running programs in school and out of school. So it's based on this national model that actually uh, is now celebrating its 50th anniversary that was based out of um, the Berkeley area and really came out of the civil rights movement in providing more opportunities for students of color to engage in um, engineering specifically. Over the last 10 years, we've really in Oregon taken on this um, more invention approach because we found that being able to provide students a more tangible project to work on, something that really they can connect with, has been really profound in their engagement. It's a, been a really great way to provide students who otherwise haven't had experience in engineering or invention to immediately engage and start building something and start taking their ideas and putting them into um, reality. So that support has really been. Um, that initiative has really been supported by the Lummelson Foundation, and so we partnered with them in creating um, the Invention Toolkit, which is something that we are training our teachers on. And yeah, we're really excited to be able to continue building our um, our area within the in Oregon. So predominantly, we've been in Portland for uh, a number of years, and now we are expanding Mesa to more places around the state. It's really interesting that you're both working on, on regional initiatives that are a part of larger national models that have a really long history. I think we'll come back to that later in the conversation. But first, let's talk about innovation education. Why do you think that matters? Why do you think an innovation education matters? I can take a quick stab at it. Uh, so. I think I touched on, touched on this a little bit when I was saying that we used to focus much more on just STEM and engineering specifically. Uh, we've really pivoted this way because I think that invention education is something that in our way that we do it, we, usually, we really use a human-centered um, design basis to it where students are engaging with a client and then they create a working prototype for that individual. That is a really interdisciplinary way of being able to learn. So you go all, you use skills from you know how to interview people, knowing how to create a design brief. You then get into sort of the hard STEM skills of math and you know and engineering when you're actually creating your prototype. And I think it's just really critical because you know the real world is not discipline based. It's actually very interdisciplinary, and there's just the way that you problem solve is never just like, oh, I'm only going to use my math skills. It's like you're going to use your math skills and your, your English skills and your art skills. You're going to really combine them together. And that's why I think invention is um, specifically invention education is so important for students to get at a young age so they can start really applying these different concepts uh, in projects. Yeah, and I absolutely agree. Nothing kind of operates on its own as we see all the time, right? Like you can't treat just math by itself, uh, especially when you're working towards a solution or working towards or addressing a problem uh, to be able to incorporate an interdisciplinary approach, but then also uh, to incorporate the, the self in that as well is kind of where those values around uh, increased focus of me having more diverse workforce, incorporating more voices at the table becomes so important to understand that not only is it an interdisciplinary approach, but it's also, um, you know, humans are needed at all 
from all backgrounds, correct? In order to be able to ensure that wherever we land with a product, service, or business, it is reflective and comprehensive of addressing the whole of the problem. Um, and I would also just add for the in innovation education in terms of why it matters and enrichment and uh, with in formal ed educational systems, what have you, that for youth to practice practice being in innovation i think you know for youth to be able to really kind of apply practicing the interdisciplinary nature to practice failing or what they might perceive as failing or you know to practice working with team members and how to use different soft skills to uh, be in a real situation <laughs> within a workplace uh to to create a solution i feel like within um it's important to have that practice when you're at a younger age so that when you do get into a more professional setting, you know, those, um, those norms around failing, those norms around like collaboration, like who has a voice at the table, those sorts of things are, youth have a chance to be able to find their footing in that a little bit earlier so that, you know, it helps to set them up for success later um, so that, you know, they're not, at 40 being like, oh, I wish I knew that, or I wish I had that sense before I, when I was 10 years old, so that, you know, without to minimize that sense of loss, or, you know, kind of wanting to be able to be in informal education a little bit more, you know, it's just building that muscle memory, to apply that learning to practice the critical thinking. Um, and yeah, just to have it couched within, with folks who are in a similar place of that, of, you know, practicing that innovation learning and practicing it with, um, with caring adults who are there to support their, their growth and their learning. Yeah, I was just going to add, and I, I, yeah, I was just going to add that I completely agree with you and especially about the being able to practice some of those soft skills because we're uh, at Mesa, we're based at the Portland State University College of Engineering and Computer Science. And we see a lot of our engineering students um, having to do those team projects. You know, it's useful in the career field, but it's also really useful once students get into college and having to, especially in the STEM fields, having to do work group projects. And I see the struggle of students right. who've never had that in the background. and having to navigate how you work on a team, how to manage uh, deadlines, the capstone projects that students have to deal with are usually extremely stressful. And so to be able to get that sort of uh, experience earlier on and understand how do I navigate with other team members? How do I become empathetic to their needs? How do we both like still set goals? So I hear you both talking about the skills and skill sets that future innovators might need to have, but let's get specific. What are the skills and mindsets that a future innovator needs to have in the frameworks that you're working with? Uh, Yoon, can you please? Absolutely. Um, and I think with, it's very apparent with our world, kind of where we're landing, it's about a year since we've all shifted to virtual, since we've all shifted to, you know, in many different ways, going from being quarantined and like adjusting to how our world has changed. Um, and so I think it's really important for a skill set of a future innovator to kind of uh, not get too comfortable. I think there's always a um, benefit to being open to knowing that change is inevitable, that, you know, one day all of a sudden things might be very different in your world. And so not being afraid to going against the norm, you know, it's really important to have some creativity and flexibility and pract yeah, practicing that cre creativity and letting it have in place in trying to figure out some solutions. Um, I think it's also really important for especially with the youth that Girls Inc. serves, um, for youth who experience a lot of norms, a lot of opinions, a lot of stereotypes, uh, especially at the age that we serve, you know, it's eighth to 12th grade, that they build those foundations of really kind of being okay with who they are, you know, even as they are transforming and trying on different social identities and placing their values, figuring out who they are, I think it's um, 
important for folks to understand that, you know, if they have a value, if they, to be okay with that and to really embrace their identity and know that how they are, how they want to show up in the world is really okay. Because I think that we're seeing that there's a stronger, we're not, we're not perfect, but there's a stronger embrace around diversity. And so I think it's important for youth to remember that that what they bring in their diverse self is a valuable thing. That's an asset. And so to not kind of cave into norms and stereotypes to kind of um, sacrifice who they are for thinking that they have to fit into our workplace, it's, our workplaces are starting to value some really diverse skill sets and diverse identities. And also kind of, I'm no, I've been noticing that, you know, there's value in being unapologetically yourself. <laughs> and so having that sort of temerity and bravery to just show up as themselves, embracing their identity, their values, um, to have that mindset of like, I'm okay with who I am, and I'm going to bring it and I know that it's an asset. Um, and kind of uh, similar, but uh, a little bit apart from that, of course, the growth mindset of approaching every failure as a learning opportunity, as knowing that there's something to learn from this, as, as kind of being able to navigate any barriers that come up and not seeing it as like a barrier, as more of like, okay, this thing happened, let's see what we can do next. Um, yeah, I feel like that those are some important skills and mindsets to, for future innovators to keep in mind. Thank you. I love bringing your whole self as an asset. Tong, how about for Oregon? Yeah, I agree with everything that Yoon was saying. And I think especially about being open and being unapologetically yourself. Uh, I think also in addition to that, knowing yourself really helps to get you to start to become empathetic to other people. I think that I, we find that that's something that is really important in when we're trying to uh, support our young inventors and any future innovator and in really thinking about, you know, how do I want to change the world? How do I want to make things around me better? And really being able to identify with people and taking the time to understand needs, I think really makes you not just, I think, a better person, but also I think makes you a really um, competitive asset to any environment you're going to go into. Because when you understand people better and when you take the time to understand diverse, not just diverse viewpoints, but the diverse life experiences that other people have, it helps inform how you're going to be an innovator and how you're going to create solutions that people might actually use in the future. Because I think that's something that people often, um, it's easy to get into when you're really great at, let's say, building and you're really great at having ideas. You start thinking about that your ideas and the things that you build are the only ones that matter. But what's challenging about that is that if you're truly, let's say, going to build these things into a venture in the future or you're trying to um, uh, create a solution for the betterment of others, let's say that's your intention, but you don't ever ask others and you don't ever get the viewpoint of other people, then you're bound to not be as successful as you could be. And really being able to build that, like those, that curiosity about other people and really being able to um, understand people who are different from you in all aspects, like where they grow up, obviously their culture background, their gender, their other identities, like that is all really going to be extremely helpful. I do want to also say that, you know, I, I think that, you know, we mentioned about being willing to fail. And I think that that is, and being able to try new things, that's extremely important for um, a future innovator. Uh, but I just want to also acknowledge that I know that that can be really difficult and challenging for those um, that some people don't actually have the privilege to fail. So when we talk about failing, we usually talk about that in the context that like, you're not going to fall forever because somebody's going to catch you. And I think that there are a lot of young people and people um, from backgrounds where, you know, the cost of failing may be too high. And I just want to make sure that we acknowledge that. And then we start to really understand how do we build a social capital so that students can feel, students and young people and future innovators can feel like they have the environment where they can try things where, you know, the cost of failing won't be so high. Let's say that they are the students or the young people who got the first scholarship in their, um, 
in their uh, in their families, but then they want to go to college and they discover something that's maybe a little bit more risky of a major. Let's say they want to. I'm just going to put it out there if they want to be an art major. Art majors are fantastic, but if you're coming from, let's say, in my in my background, if you're coming from an immigrant background, if you're going to be an art major, um, that may not be as successful for your family in terms of socioeconomics. That may be a really uh, risky endeavor for you to go into, but we have to be able to support students in being able to pursue those and acknowledge that not everybody has the privilege to be able to select um, those opportunities where they can be innovative. So building support system, building mentorship programs and being able to um, recognize that there are, that that in itself, being able to take that risk is um, not something that's just about an individual. It's something about a whole ecosystem. Um, and then, yeah, I think that being able to be open to the possibilities that you have and realizing that being a future innovator also means that you can like start with small things. Not everything has to be world uh, changing. So there are like small, you know, like you was talking about we're in the pandemic now. And I think that there's, you know, really small innovations that I'm just seeing every single day. And I think that being able to open your mind and thinking like, whoa, huh, I wonder how can we change those things and not, it doesn't have to be um, a big uh, invention all the time. And if I can add on to that real quick, I really appreciate you bringing up that last piece, Tong, around um, privilege around failure, because you're correct. Like people can't afford to fail sometimes because of whether it's societal norms or how that identity shows up in a workplace and how other people respond to that and maybe financial. And so it just makes me think also, because I feel like that there's a lot of pressure to be a certain way often, you know, and depending on the time. So, you know, there may be a lot of pressure right now in our uh, a way more aware sense around social justice issues of, you know, being a certain way around so social advocacy or, or something around like someone's identity of how, oh gosh, I wish I, you know, did this when I was younger in order to like go against the norm. But I think that part of, you know, something that folks need to give themselves is grace as well to know that, you know, people make decisions that's right for them at the time. And that might mean, you know, deciding that there is no room for failure right now, that, you know, there are other things that folks need to do in order to survive. And that might mean getting into college. <laughs> that might mean making some money for their family, you know, because of a lack around intergenerational wealth. And so I just really appreciate you bringing up that tongue because I do think that, you know, we speak about these lofty ideals, um, but we need to incorporate the intersectionality with it as well. So we're talking about individuals and the skills that individuals need to have, the way that you're that you're supporting them, building social capital, building relationships and relational networks. Um, I wanna zoom out a bit because you're also both working with these complex organizations that do have systems change goals. So I'm curious, what parts of your work do you see as, uh, as direct service? And what parts are, do you see as as working within sort of the whole system of an, of innovation education or or um, youth development, however you define it, I, I, I do think there's an interesting tension or balance between the direct service and the systems change work, and I'm curious how you incorporate that into your work. Uh, Tong, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a really great question. So, the direct service that we do is. Um, it's actually interesting. We talk about how we work with middle and high school students, but like I mentioned earlier, we actually are predominantly a professional development organization. So the direct service we have is providing training to teachers. And these teachers are actually, uh, it's really important to note that they're actually educators who are based in schools. So it's not actually external uh, or informal educators or non-school based educators. And I mentioned that because I think that that is actually why we're able to have a little we have, we do have systemic change in some regards because what we're doing is we're interacting with students, we're interacting with the teachers, and then 
we also have um, different components in our program like uh, competitions and we require volunteers where we bring in uh, folks from industry to participate in that. So we're in a really special nexus point where we actually have multiple parts of the STEM and innovation ecosystem interacting together. And the fact that we're based at Portland State also um, allows for the higher ed component to be brought in. And I think that one of the things that I've really been working on is trying to orient these different entities together in some of our advocacy goals where we can actually try to uh, advocate for greater, a greater agenda within equity in STEM education because there's a lot of folks that we interact with and it can be very transactional, but we have to recognize our special place that we're in where because we work with all these different people to not be able to to not take advantage of that where we can actually orient people around a specific goal I think is just is a wasted opportunity so we've been trying to figure out like when we're actually working with these different entities in our program based um, approaches but pulling them into other convenings where we're talking about well what are the you know barriers for success let's say for a um, for retaining a person of color in a tech company. Because while that may not have anything to do with our invention curriculum, our ultimate goal for our students is that they're going to be successful and leaders in whatever they do. And if they're going to go into a company where nobody cares about retaining them, then that's a problem. Then we didn't succeed. And that's not on the students. That's on the system. So we're trying to right now identify some of those pain points where we see that you know, there's obviously at the industry end, but then there's you know in higher ed why students are not retained and trying to think of should there be more bridge programs and then in K through 12, are there ways that teachers can teach STEM education um, in a more with a more inclusive pedagogy and they can bring um, like computer science into their classroom in a way that doesn't perpetuate terrible gender and race stereotypes, and so that's where you know that's I feel like one of the most fun parts of my job is to be able to uh, support our mission in a more uh, broad way as that's greater than our day-to-day -day work, which our greater day-to-day -day work is fantastic, but uh, I have really appreciated being able to see these other aspects of the ecosystem. Yeah, and you touch upon so much that I agree wholeheartedly with. And, you know, with our direct service with the youth, we. I definitely approach it as sort of a fractal within a larger and, and it can be reflective within a larger scheme. Um, and so with our direct service, you know, we encourage them to practice some of that hands-on, minds-on, untimed, ungraded, all those opportunities to, you know, bring in different mediums to provide the exploration within a framework of, you know, innovation and solutions-based thinking. Um, and you know, couching it within a community space. And so providing that network of caring adults who provide the guidance and mentorship and also the safe landing spot to help youth process and communicate and develop those soft skills um, and promoting that, that there's no right or wrong. But the piece that I wanna focus on there is that uh, community and partnership component of it, of, you know, cause while the youth are practicing this, um, we're kind of, when we bring in partners of, in that community space, and they may come to us from many different places, but from what our youth see, they're just caring adults who care, who are invested in how they are achieving, right? And so when we bring in ad caring adults, we, you know, the hierarchies around who, who what power structures we have or that sort of thing is kind of, diminish because we want the youth to be able to understand this is a community that is all about relationships and how we are understanding our spheres of influence, how we're understanding our impact and how we're understanding our assets um, in that it's not better or worse than anybody else. We all just kind of have a role to play to make a positive impact on the youth. Ultimately, that is what we're all seeking, right? Because they're gonna grow up and whatever they take and, and internalize, they're gonna also uh, play out within a future scheme. But we also kind of acknowledge that for our the adults that are part of that, they are may take it back to you know their boardrooms or the donor the, the donor platforms or wherever it might be to 
really kind of understand what role they play in getting the youth to stay within a job, right? Like, I absolutely agree. If we are encouraging youth to um, take on STEM college and career options, but then that place, there's a lot of things in that place that expel them from that. Um, you know, we need to examine how our, I love that word ecosystem, how our ecosystems, how our partnerships and how our coalitions are getting back to that room of around that community space of having vested adults, you know, having them understand this is about ultimately the youth growing up and like staying in a place like that. And so, you know, and so we definitely try to work with partners and coalitions and looking at different, you know, advisory committees or spaces in which we can promote a, play, a way for pe people within their own spheres of influence to understand the role that they have, whether they want it or not, but <laughs> the role that they have of housing and making it a safe, uh, an inclusive place for folks. Um, and we can't, as I just keep referring to the pandemic because I feel like it's so emblematic of all these sorts of things. As we can see, and it's made more apparent, even if we were to operate on our own, it does, the world doesn't work that way, right? And so, you know, everybody has an impact on everybody else. Um, and so to reorient us, to understand our role and our responsibility in that, to, to contribute towards that systemic change, I think we try as, to the best of our ability to have folks kind of understand that. And then so that when they move away from girls in spaces, that ability to influence that systems change is still there, even if they're not directly having us in mind. That's something that they have a responsibility around. And I think that, so also internally, I think, you know, with our practice and pedagogy, we do try as much as possible because we are a femme organization, <laughs> you know, we you look at feminist issues and we have our bill of rights, um, look at how we are leading differently. And so, you know, kind of addressing head on that, all the norms that we have in our workplace of, and focusing on alternatives. And so, perhaps leading with emotional intelligence and you know, helping youth understand their values and voice, flipping the script a little bit of um, challenging our norms and how we have operated. So you both are taking such thoughtful approaches with the communities you work with, both your partners and, your, and the youth that you're working with. Um, and what happens when they leave Oregon Mesa or or Girls Inc. Pacific Northwest? How, you know, do they, what's the pathway that they take? Do they go to college? Are there, you know, what are the main barriers or what's working as a pathway? And be frank, you know, even though I'm representing PSU, please, um, please illustrate what barriers you see when, when your stakeholders are moving out of your immediate sort of realm of influence. Uh, Yoon, go ahead. Yeah, so we, as a goal of Eureka, of course, we acknowledge that STEM career options are, we want the youth to be economically empowered. Um, and we acknowledge that STEM is one of those, you know, higher side, um, higher paid uh, jobs at, in the marketplace. And so we definitely encourage youth to, it also with Eureka being a STEM program, is to have youth choose college and career options after they leave Girls Inc. And so a lot of our language, um, a lot of our curriculum, a lot of our practices point youth in that direction of looking at higher education and also having that focus within STEM. Um, and so we have various curriculum that helps to de demystify what higher education means. You know, we talk, a lot of our youth are first generation college students. And so we acknowledge that that college and career language may not always be, have a high presence in the home. And so we, we offer uh, workshops and other sorts of things to, you know, decode that of like what a dorm is, what FAFSA means, how to apply for scholarships, um, all that kind of stuff, what PhD means. Um, and so we lean into, let's just decode that. Let's talk about what college looks like. Let's talk about interviewing. Let's talk about resume writing. Um, we also approach it from a partnership standpoint because we have some really great partners who care deeply about getting youth into higher education. So, you know, they'll pass along scholarship opportunities. They'll pass along um, 
uh, various workshops and stuff like that that youth are welcome to uh, participate in. Um, and as well as we hold our camps at various uh, colleges and universities across Metro Portland, Portland State being one of them, um, and to kind of build that familiarity for youth, you know, when they're making a college option of, oh, I'm familiar with Portland State, I know where the Mesa building is, I know where the rec center is, you know, having that familiarity is very um, accessible for youth. So even, so as they're making choices, they may consider Portland State or apply that learning towards understanding how a campus is set up elsewhere. Um, we do acknowledge that, you know, for, for youth, um, some of those barriers may again be present and that's having, again, going back to allowing for youth and really kind of encouraging youth to make the choices that are right for them because they, you know, finances are very much an issue for some of our youth that we serve or, you know, they have been having a really hard time with a traditional education system and so may not have, you know, gotten the grades or, you know, the test scores to put them into a higher education um, pathway. But we embrace that for all of our youth, they are in different pathways to better understand how they show up in STEM or what their future career pathway will be. And so we, part of our curriculum, part of our pedagogy, part of our engagement with the youth is really having them suss out what are their goals? What are they hope? What are their goals, and what do they need to do to get to achieve that? So that if they do ultimately want to go to college, um, but may not be in that same place, let's we talk to them about like, all right, like how do we get you there? Or we also explore alternative ways as well. Um, and I think you know one thing with higher education institutions is. I, I think it's really important for them to consider how they're building the relationships. I'll always go back to the relationships because ultimately I feel like that that's one of the more, most powerful tools that we have uh, for engagement and for um, building relationships, just like having that as a framework. Um, and so while we have our youth go to colleges and universities, we also really love to build a stronger relationship with the faculty, with various staff members, whoever it might be, so that we, us on the program end can really understand all that we can offer for the youth um, and on the higher institution end of it to understand that it's a um, investment back into the community, regardless of whether or not they choose to go to that specific institution. Um, it is all within the larger objective of you know, caring for our youth and, and ensuring that they can, that they are capable and able to make those choices. Interesting. So you're saying that the pathway really requires uh, both universities to be building it and for youth organizations to be building it and somewhere along the path we're working together and meeting. What do you think Yeah, Abby, that's exactly, uh, that's I 100% would agree with that. And I really appreciated you talking about um, relationships because, I mean, I think this is the truth that we experience, but also probably the truth that people don't want to talk about, which is that it takes a lot of people. And I think that people are always oftentimes looking for a quick fix where it's like, oh, we're going to have this one solution and hand wave it. And then that's how we're going to get, let's say, more underrepresented or first generation students to specifically matriculate and then actually graduate. I think it it all comes down to people. And the fact that, you know, you're just talking about the relationship between youth serving organizations and higher ed, the handoffs are oftentimes pretty rough. Um, and not just between an organization that's not based in school, the handoff between high school and higher education um, actually does not exist. It pretty much is you graduate from high school and then good luck you get to, if you got into college, fantastic. But I think that really thinking about it, I've had the you know, opportunity to work with some students just throughout my career um, in that, not just the application phase, I think we focus a lot on applications, which is important. But once you get into college, that phase between let's say the spring of your senior year and when you're gonna actually finish the first term of college, 
is some of the most important time, I, not of the entire college experience, but some of the most important time because having to deal with their financial aid, having to be able to um, know the right sign up for the classes. Um, I've seen so many students go through that phase, those phases, especially if they're first generation college student and being completely confused. And I don't blame them because oftentimes I'm helping them and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm based at a college. I should know. I'm like next door to the advisors, but it's really confusing. And if you're not spending a lot of time on it, um, it's, it's not hard to imagine that if you don't have the time and you don't have other adults helping you through the process, like how could you be able to understand what that information is. So I think that that's a lot more that, I mean, I'm a huge proponent of bridge programs. I think we need more bridge programs um, because the this really rough jump is not so much just like, oh, okay, matriculating into the college classes. I think the matriculating into college classes is sometimes easier than the actual like signing up for classes, the actual knowing which orientations you go to, knowing whether or not if you went to community college and say, and then you're transferring to the higher ed, whether or not you, community college and you're transferring to a four-year institution, whether or not your class is actually transferred, whether or not you wasted your time on some credits that you know you spent money on and now won't be able to transfer. Um, I think that those are a lot of if we want to retain students, uh, I think it's really important to think about how can we make these handoffs more seamless for the student experience. So, you know, I always go back to human centered design. How can we actually design this system so that it is actually user friendly? Because I think currently it's not user friendly. What happens with Mesa is that we try to expose students as much as possible. Um, and I really appreciate what you was talking about trying to decode some of these elements of. Um, what the college experience is like, that really helps to get students excited about college. But I think we need to, like we at Mesa need to do a better job too, to help, you know, really help students through that matriculation pro process and being able to partner with the folks that um, are in our own host institution and other host institutions to really build better bridge programs. And then, um, and then better support programs overall, because again, there's a lot of uh, students who have connections at home or mentors already who can support them or, but there's also a lot of students who don't have those support systems. And we have to recognize that those support systems are the ones who are gonna be there for you when you're really questioning whether or not you should continue in your math class. Like let's say you failed, failed your math class again. Do you, how are you gonna actually persist if someone's not there, you know, kind of cheering you on and helping you? support you through that process. And with that aspect of bring math, I do wanna, I always try to champion this whenever I get an opportunity to. Math, the way that math education is structured is a, is a very high barrier. So we get a lot of students excited about invention and engineering and these sort of STEM fields, but then we don't really think about how, um, how much of a linear and ladder um, way that we have structured the math classes so that they're huge barrier points. So if you don't pass a specific math class, pretty much your odds of getting into a STEM um, major are, um, they go dramatically down. So we both need to do a better job preparing students for math, but also understand, well, maybe does this really make sense? Does it really make sense for these math classes to be barriers or how can we be able to structure this in a way so that they don't have to be like a, the one single barrier that prevents you from moving forward? I think these are really helpful calls to action and calls to awareness. And um, I invite anyone participating or listening to consider our own role and what Tong and Yoon are recommending. Um, so with all of what you're describing, it sounds like things have changed so much since your organizations have started 50 years ago. And I'm just so curious what's gonna happen in the next 50 years with invention and innovation education and the kind of youth service work that you're doing. What do you think? What do you think is the future of innovation education? That's a huge question. <laughs> it um, sounds like you have the answer. You. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, clearly our world is 
interconnected um, through so many different ways. That's just the word that we should be living with is the interconnectedness. And I think with virtual, I, I you know, how we've all responded to be, to better uh, leverage our technologies and our virtual systems and our virtual capabilities, I don't think it's going away. And so I think, you know, that is a trend to just, you know, I, I, it's not new. I think it's just now even more apparent uh, of how that's just going to have a presence moving forward is the technologies, the virtual technologies. And I think with, in terms of like education or at least like in how people interact, I always think about, I go back to that community aspect, you know, it's just so clear that our our ideals are at least, you know, Western facing ideals around individualism or grit or ruggedness, you know, that's can't, that can only get you so far. But when, but when folks work in a, as a community and, and share resources and, you know, help to leverage resources and work together, that that is much more powerful and impactful. And so I think, I hope that, you know, in the future that there's a stronger focus in that of understanding the power of community rather than just the individualism. And sure, of course, everyone has individual skills and traits that uh, contribute towards the, the bigger picture, right? And so uh, having that asset-based approach, but, you know, to uh, take that within a grander schema around community, I think, I really hope that that has a stronger foothold for the future. And also the how important it is to just talk to each other and work together, you know, check in with, you know, various um, parts of our institution as we ha have seen through the rollout of certain things, how, you know, one thing that I just keep hearing is um, I wish that my voice, you know, had a stronger presence in that decision um, so that, you know, how I show up in this decision feels a little bit better. It feels a little bit easier to implement. Um, and so that I hope that that's something that folks are taking away is around really understanding the power of collaboration and to be able to just have those communication skills and also collaboration skills. Uh, I'm really glad you used to, you took that uh, to begin with because it is a really big question. And I also want to say, usually I'm like the yay community person on a panel. So I'm really exci excited that Yoon is also all about that. So I don't have to say those things, but I just wanted to say like, I 100% agree with those. I'm not just saying like, you know, anyway, I'm not just saying silent on those items because I just feel like you and you've already covered them. Uh, I think the other, I think one thing I want to expand on from that I've seen, I don't know what the world is going to be like. And I, I think one of the things that I really hope that we leave the current situation um, with is that, you know, I'll just throw one small example. I have always thought that, you know, oh, one-on-one -on -one in-person connection is the most important thing. All of our events have to be in-person and, you know, we just will never be able to get that in a virtual sense. This is pre-pandemic. And I've realized that, you know, there are actually some things in the virtual environment that actually work better. And I've had it's not like I devalue the in-person connection because I think that that is still extremely key, but it's really challenged my way of thinking to think, you know, what is the way that we've done things that we've always done it just because we've assumed that that's the way that we should be doing it. Mm -hmm. And how can we take the lessons of what we're learning now to really be able to apply it um, to the future? So let's not leave this, let's, let's not leave this pandemic having learned no lessons and just go back. What I'm actually really afraid of is um, one of the things that I've seen that is, I think a huge detriment in certain environments is that, especially in education, um, I think uh, it gets worse, unfortunately, at a higher ed institution, let's say in big like STEM classes where it's just lecture based, right? You're just, people are talking at people like 300 people and you realize that, you know, there are in this current environment when that's being done, you have 300 people on a Zoom call. I can guarantee you like 200 of those students are actually asleep or they're like, they just turned on, they, they logged onto Zoom and then they're actually like in, I don't know, they're watching Netflix on the side or And I don't blame them because like, why is that an effective way of learning? And I certainly am unfortunately one of those people that slept a lot in my college classes. And I hope that we actually take 
the this opportunity to realize you know there are certain kinds of content content especially i think in science and um, in stem fields where it just has to be more hands-on it should be more project-based and like let's not go back to those big lecture series um some i understand the utility of that but it's sort of an economy of scale thing i feel like that's why some of those exist but i think that a lot of the um, and I'm seeing this honestly, even in you know K through 12. So if you have you know a lecture about science in a classroom, virtual classroom of 20 students, and all the kids have their cameras shut off, students just are not learning. And I think that really being able to apply these project-based principles, um, even in the virtual environment, because that's what we're doing in Mesa right now. Our programs are virtual entirely, but they're still project-based. So we have. Um, supplies shipped to students' homes and being able to work on those projects um, together. The students have told us the things that they've really appreciated is actually being in breakout rooms with their other teammates, talking to each other, working on stuff. So they, you know, it's not so much like we've thrown a lot of like flashy things at them, but the things that they really said the most based on the survey was just like, we appreciated talking with other students because they're not getting that opportunity right now. They're not, a lot of times they're in a classroom where they don't get to actually talk with other kids. So I hope that, and I think that really supports their learning because they're engaging with the content more. They're actually working with other people on it. Um, so yeah, I hope that we keep going with this and that um, we maybe, maybe not eliminate, but consider those like just entirely lecture-based um, content and think about, you know, can that just be asynchronous? Can people just watch it whenever they want to? Does that really, do we really need to trap everybody in a room for an hour? That's you know, one thing I'm hearing from both of you over the course of this conversation is how important and complex the context is around learning, innovation and invention. And, and I think we could, we could always talk about the tools and we could always talk about the skills, but what I'm hearing is that there's there's something that's so foundational to adopting those skills, and that is this ever-changing environment that's unique to every person. And it, and it comes across so much when you're describing, um, you know, when you're describing somebody's ability to interact online or you know somebody's willingness to take risks. Each of those comes with such a set of factors that's unique to every person, and um, and it just makes me curious if you could share a story. You know, this doesn't have to be a story of risk or a story of an online education, but from your experience in in innovation education, what's a story that represents to you the kind of work that you're doing or um, something that you would hope we can take away from this conversation? Uh, Tong. Uh, so I do have a story and actually my story does uh go to my earlier point about community. So this is hopefully going to support you, like what you've been talking about. Um, I think that one of the things, one of the stories that really, I think, best exemplifies the ecosystem, um, not just approach, but the way that all of this is um, interconnected is we had our first demo day, which our demo day is kind of similar to other demo days that people know about. We actually, um, in our invention ecosystem, uh, really learn from our other PSU colleagues uh, like, uh, and be able to develop our first pitch competition. So the pitch competition was for, um, it was back in 2017, the first that we had. And what was really amazing about that was that we've had competitions in the past where it was just like, just for students and um, just for uh, our Mesa Day competition. But the Demo Day competition uh, was one that we ended up uh, wanting to host because we wanted to be able to provide students the opportunity to share what they were doing with a wider audience and have that wider audience be um, an open audience. So anybody from the general public, we were really hoping to use it as a, um, as a uh, volunteer recruitment um, method and it didn't quite do that. What was really interesting was the way that we helped, we hosted it and all the sort of like after effects from it. So one, we ended up hosting our, um, our demo day at Ziva Design. So Ziva Design is a product design firm um, in Portland. And we ended up getting connected to Ziva Design because we had a, um, 
a parent of a student who was at one of the Mesa schools uh, actually have a connection at Ziba and we were telling them about Demo Day and they're like, oh, well, have you ever considered Ziba? We have a great community room. Would you like to have that um, host your event in that room? We're like, oh, that's fantastic. So we got connected through them. And then when we had our uh, pitch competition, the students also had the opportunity to um, go to uh, Ziba and get like a special tour around their facilities. And what was so amazing to me about that was that students were, you know, were in those spaces and uh, a lot of them were in middle school, some of them in high school. Nobody had ever heard of the word product designer before, but coming out of that, all of our students wanted to be product designers. Like they were just like, we were just, I remember them um, coming out uh, after their tour and they're like, oh yeah, I wanna be a product designer when I, when I, you know, in the future now. And it was so amazing because that, that like sort of place-based experience was so critical to what, um, what they were doing. The other aspect of this like demo day experience, which I really just like, it's a very special 2017 demo day experience, was that we also um, invited Juan Barraza to come and be one of our judges for, um, for the event. And at that event, one of the teams that ended up presenting was uh, from McKay High School. And he connected with those students from McKay High School. And then later those students went on to actually compete in the Clean Tech Challenge and win the Clean Tech Challenge and then later compete in Bend, Oregon. And I think that like, that's sort of a messy story, but one of the most important things about it is like, I feel like we had all aspects of the, the ecosystem at play. And some of them were in, unintentional, some of them were intentional, but I think the more opportunity that we bring people together in different respects, like from companies, from the educators, from students, and allow not for people to operate in silos, that's where like I think really beautiful things happen. And so I feel like that's what um, that's one of the things that I've really appreciated. Um, being able to operate in our space is because, like I mentioned, the fact that we get to interact with all of these different segments. Yeah, so I would say that that's probably the story that um, I love the most and best exemplifies uh, what I think that we're doing in Mesa. It really does. Thank you so much. Yoon, what, what story comes to mind for you? Yeah, thank you for sharing that story, Tong. I feel like it's, it's such a just such a good example around how when folks work towards a, a similar goal, how like the impact that that can really have. Um, and to share the the shout outs, I kind of I my story that I'm going to share uh, kind of goes back to what you had shared, Tong, around the um, youth learning from youth or youth just learn just having that space to learn and grow together um, element of it. Because if I think about my, I've been in informal education for um, quite some time. And if I think about all of my favorite moments with the youth, um, it often comes from an experience in which the youth are able to challenge themselves in a way that, in, that removes all those sorts of um, you know, lack of confidences or any, you know, insecurities that they have from, from about themselves so that when they participate in this particular activity or problem that they get to really shine and that their assets really get to have a place within that community. Um, so I think of one particular example where uh, youth were trying to just solve a problem, trying to figure out how to be able to either come up with, and in, the, in this case, it wasn't a product, it was more around how do we um, work together as a team to be able to come up with a solution for this. And it was just, what I took away from that was just how the youth were so supportive of each other um, that, you know, because of the fact that their insecurities, that their um, anything that might give them pause was not necessarily as present of how much space that allowed for them to show up in group care, you know, their self care had been taken care of. And so they were able to show up in a stronger way for group care. And so that allowed for the group to really support each other in uh, sharing their ideas and, you know, have it be an open space of 
hey, you're really good at this. Why don't you do this? And um, folks being open to it and really embracing it and stepping up uh, as a part of this group toward group work towards a solution. And, you know, that's just so um, proud mama moment <laughs> to see how, you know, folks are have a chance to apply their learning and really kind of shine in the moment. Um, and so those are the stories that I that I look back to often is how to be able to recreate that over and over. Like, what are the conditions that allow for that to happen? And how what what are those things that we just don't let go so that the youth can continue to do that and feel proud of themselves in that moment? Thank you so much to both of you for the stories and the insights. I, it sounds cliche, but I think what I'm hearing is like, we, uh, it takes all of us <laughs> and we all have to be, um, we all have to be putting out the effort like you in your example of the pathway between youth organizations and, uh, and universities or higher ed, that it's, that it's two ways. And, and in that may be the case in every moment here. So I, um, I'm hearing that and, and also thinking about how I can make it actionable, um, appreciating your insights based on all of your experience, your work every day in this space, and your ability to zoom out and sort of describe this as a universal recommendation for the future of innovation education. Um, thanks so much for your time. And I think we'll see each other again soon. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.